Hey, it's Chris. One thing I wonder as someone who watches other people's videos, right? When you see a video on a crowdfunding page, you go, how much do they actually like that game? How much does that game stay with them? Is that game actually how good as they're saying it is? Or, you know, when that game actually passes by in the hype and the hotness train, is it actually anything they're still considering? Well, let me let you in on a little secret. Let me show you. Okay, year end. Looking back at all the ones I talked about that were coming or that came to crowdfunding that I had a hands on with games whose projects may have had a video of mine on the page or they chose not to use my video. What were my looking back now top 10 games from that, right? Did they actually stand out ones that it may be in the moment? It was a little bit harder to tell. How does Chris really feel right? Or are they just saying it? Th those thoughts definitely as a consumer, as someone who's watching those videos, those previews, the impressions, whatever you want to call them, right? Because it's not a final product. How does he really feel about them at the end? I'm going to give you my top 10 in order, 10 to one of these are the ones that if you're looking at my channel at the year end, you can look back and say, these are the ones that he is most impressed by now having done many of them since then. Let's go preamble over. Now, to be clear in this video, right, this is also not a what is absolutely, utterly, objectively best, because that's slightly different. You know, game mechanics, but also player dynamics, as well as fit, as well as ease of access to get to the table, and just being able to get it played in the first place. All of those factor in, let me be very clear. Some of these may be objectively better games, but they might not be as high on the list because of some of those factors, just putting that out there. And you know what? For your money, for all of the dollars you're spending on this, I'm gonna give you two extra. We're gonna start with two honorable mentions. Honorable mention number two, because we're going backwards, right? Two to one and then to 10. So honorable mention number two, Weird Wood Manor. Sort of a, a very interesting twist on the cooperative game where you have asymmetric room-based actions with a spinning mechanism of going around and around and around of the actual board that spins. This was a difficult cooperative game. Now, the reason it's only an honorable mention at this point is because accessibility. This game has a lot more overhead. It has a lot more literal and figurative moving parts from a cooperative sense. And ultimately, it's gonna be harder than pretty much every other game on this list to actually get to the table, not because I don't like it, but because of those factors. And as a hard co-op fan, definitely, definitely look worth a C. No regrets about that game whatsoever in that sense. It's a good, very solid game. Now, indie publisher, slightly higher price with a, more than a few of these on this list, but that's essentially what you're gonna get as well. Does it absolutely stand out as doing something completely and utterly different? Maybe not, but it's got some nuance and some mechanistic approach that is definitely going to give you a run for your money that you haven't seen before with that spinning in the room mechanism and the bad guys lurking in and out and you trying to make your way to the center and back. So no question, got something new. There's a reason it did so well on crowdfunding in the first place. Honorable mention number one. From This Way Games, the previous publishers of ICE, now giving us founders, cryo architects, tile laying, abstract-esque, with a very unique scoring system. And the scoring system of this is completely obtuse, very difficult to understand, but boy, does it click when you actually click it. You're laying down these tiles that have a two hex by three hex on the bottom, and you can flip it any way, but you don't know which exact arrangement potentially of the colors you're getting because you're choosing a tile at the beginning of your turn, but you can use potentially either side. And so you can kind of use a little deduction if you see a certain number of colors on one side, you can deduce that they're gonna be the other colors on the other side because every tile has every color, you just don't know how many of each necessarily. And then you have to pattern lay in sort of a hex-based large grid coinciding with everyone else laying theirs down as well. And you don't know what secret objective in terms of scoring that the other people are gonna have. And again, the scoring is the completely most obtuse thing that's very difficult spatially to handle, but boy, does it really click when it clicks? And I was really impressed by this one. Again, this one reminds me very much in a different way of Factory Funner. If you're familiar at all with Factory Funner, the more recent edition from Allplay, 
This is an absolutely brain burning game of tile laying that should play in less than 30 to 45 minutes or 60 minutes at most. Granted, it's going to take you at least twice that because of how difficult it is to arrange this very small pattern of hexes. And it's uniquely enjoyably satisfying. But because of that brain burniness, I can't play that level of brain burniness all the time. People I play with, especially my wife, uh-uh. She's going to look at me like she wants to hit me. And those are her words, not mine. So um, that's why that one is also the other honorable mention, because I, I think this is going to be a sleeper hit for people as well who got in on this. So no questions there. I'm going to give you one special one here thrown in. Honorable mention number zero. Between 10, better than the honorable mentions, something that I really enjoy, but I know it's going to be very divisive. And it was very divisive even with the first game. It was very divisive uh, with the second campaign about how well people liked it or people just fell fat, flat completely. But that is Beast Shattered Isles. This is a one versus all game. This is, you know, marked and people were really exclaiming it essentially or focused on the fact that it was hidden movement. But it's not hidden movement, folks. It's mostly asymmetric battling with card driven strategy and the hidden movement is there but it's definitely not the main crux of it and if you focus on the main crux of it instead of the strategic asymmetric build and head-to-head -head take that of the monster versus the potential hunters where the hunters are more passive the monster has to be more aggressive they have to be more knowledgeable i mean that's the problem with one versus all games in a nutshell right is the person who teaches the game inevitably almost always has to be the one because of the asymmetric learning curve that goes with these and there's nothing bad about that but that makes the overall ease of access to a lot of these games a little bit more difficult as a nutshell right i'm looking at the world of smog the others from simon i love those games but you know how hard those are to get to the table repeatedly if you don't have the same consistent group and this one is going to suffer no less than those again i really like this dynamic i really love one versus all but it's not easy to get to the table and so that's why you know in all good spirits all of those factors like i mentioned at the beginning of the video they have to be taken into account for that aspect of things does it change my love for this game any less no it just means i have to say okay where does that really realistically from a here standpoint how does that fit i love the acrylics i love the artwork i really like the gameplay driven card use and the asymmetry is outstanding and just giving you more of what you want in the first place with this expansion is exactly what this game needs to give it more longevity so I can't make any complaints from that aspect of things. But like I said, if you go into this thinking this is going to be a highly, highly deductive, well, I mean, highly, highly hidden movement where you're going to, you know, sleuth it out. But if you're really looking for it from a Fury of Dracula or a Whitechapel standpoint, one of those where it is highly deductive, highly hidden, and you spend the majority of time doing that, this is going to be the opposite. And so I think that's also why it fell flat with people, because what you're thinking it is maybe also what it was kind of marketed as, or really the key words that were being thrown out by not just them, but by people that were crowdfunding it the first time around, you know, that isn't exactly where its strength is. And it's not supposed to be where its strength is. But if that's what you go into this, well, yeah, then it's not going to mesh with you in that sense. So how do you feel about those aspects of things? One versus all, repeated play. Do you want to be the one versus all all the time? Do you have the group dynamic for this as a whole? Because some other people really don't like this. You know, does it work well as a two player game? Yeah, it does. Is it best at three? Yeah, because you have one versus two because you need at least two hunters on the other side. Again, is that going to fit you? That's why it's going to be just harder to get to the table regardless. But I love it just along the same lines of something like a Guards of Atlantis 2, which is going to be incredibly hard for me to get to the table, but it's not going anywhere either there. So let's get to the top 10 now. Top 10, number 10, Itaria. Again, nobody watched my video on this whatsoever. I'm going to go out and Medias Games, um, they put out an absolutely fantastic little abstract game here. And it takes the combination, combinatorial color number system that we've seen with several other games. One of my favorite abstract games as a whole, Tintas, does something very similar, right? You need the majority of the majority. You need the majority of each of the seven tokens of the seven different colors. Only they give you this black and white grid that's variable setup. And you have to place them on a color when you pull them from a bag. Or you can not have the complete randomness of pulling uh, several colors from a bag and you can take them from a predetermined more strategic setup 
either lined up around or something variable that they give you in several different ways, depending on how much luck, mitigation, and randomness you want in the first place. For a low price point, this is an absolute fantastic abstract game. And the, and the sad part was they actually had to like do a second crowdfunding because the first time around they had some issues. So it only got $12,000, folks. But I kid you not, if you like abstract games, this one should be on your radar. Just putting that out there as an abstract lover to another abstract lover out there. Check it out. Give it some interest. Give them a look-see. Tell them Leech sent you. So then let's get to number nine. Fractured Sky IV Studios. Um, this is just a solid game. Now, yes, it's probably, again, like a lot of their games. It's over-deluxified. It's going to cost you more than it probably should. But it's really a different game altogether. And Ivy Studios, I give them a lot of kudos. Like, I don't like all of the games equally from them. Period, right? There's another one on this list coming up later. Um, but... One thing that they do, very much so akin to Roxley, and I give them a ton of kudos for this, absolutely, is the variety in the mechanisms, the approach, the aesthetic, right? You think of Roxley, right? You've got Dice Throne. You've got Brass. You've got Radlands, right? Holy forking shirt balls, Batman. That is different. You've got Moonrakers. You've got Veiled Fate. You've got this now. And you have the other one that, again, no spoilers, right? But those are dynamically different aesthetic as well as mechanistic approaching games. And so to have all of that under one umbrella and to all do as well as they have and to be as well received, that's not a small accomplishment. And so you can say maybe this one isn't for you. I mean, Fractured Sky is going to be a little bit more divisive. I think this is better fit for me than Veiled Fate, though. Veiled Fate is just too much meta. It becomes a meta, meta, meta deduction game. Fractured Sky is deduction. It's sneaky, sneaky resource management style game with this upside down bidding for only a total value summed between all of your airships and how you upgrade the asymmetric options that you have depending on where you want to strategize. The islands, I mean, that's the dynamic part that I'm not sure about. The limited availability between the islands, the very slow engine asymmetric build as you're going, you know, a few of those things, hopefully that gets tweaked a little bit. I'm not a game designer. I don't know how those things go anyway, but just, you know, I, the biggest problem I have with engine building, right, is I want to feel like my engine is really revving up at some point, and that's what I'd like to see. Like, I want to have a plethora of options. I don't want to be like, okay, well, I get this very limited build and I'm, I'm very strategized and there's very limited aspects of that by the end. And this is going to be an interesting test because I just don't know what to make of the end product at this point, how well it's going to be received, because it's going to be niche. It's going to be more niche than I'd say the other two that I mentioned already from them in Veiled Fate and Moonraker. So again, very interesting dynamic, completely different going out there. And I give them kudos because it did really well as well. Next up, this one, mechanically speaking, game-wise, I think this is going to be on a lot of people's 2024 best of lists. A couple of these will be, actually. This one in particular, Old King's Crown. Super impressed by this game. One of the best aesthetically pleasing games easily of 2023, regardless of retail, arriving crowdfunding, or in this case, not even funded crowdfunding. And the dynamic, though, at least three to four players and the asymmetric abilities between both of them, it just means that you need to have this game played several times. You need more into it to get the full extent out of it. This is probably one of the few that I would dare say compare it to in a metaphorical sense of Root, where if you don't know what you're getting into with this game and you back this, you could have this fall completely flat because this is going to be a dynamic game. Yes, you can pigeonhole, you can turtle, you can do your own thing and not interact and cause chaos or deal with the other players directly, but that's not going to be where this game shines. This game is going to shine at the three, four, maybe even five if you have a group like that because of the simultaneous play, because of the I'm laying cards down, flipping them up, and going aspect of things. The bidding, the dynamics, the stealing cards from other people, the getting my deck built stronger as I go along, the predicting if I can grab this area, well, I get a bonus for being able to predict the one that I'm gonna win in the first place. Now the end game is, you know, could potentially drag out a little bit because you go until a certain amount of points. 
And if it is really even, well, the game might be a little longer, but you don't want a runaway leader in the first place. So that's actually a little bit of a good thing at the same time. So I don't really think that this game is anything other than what it is, but I fear like Root that people are gonna buy it thinking one thing, and then when it doesn't turn into what they thought it was going to be, eh, this isn't a good game. It's a fine forking game. It's one of the best games of the year I played. But if you don't know what you're getting yourself into, just like Root, you know where it's gonna end up? It's gonna end up on the trade pile. So that's why it is number eight. Number seven, covered it. Speaking of hard cooperatives, this is the next hard cooperative on this list. This is Defenders of the Wild, Outlandish Games. It's solid. Again, probably the closest thing I have seen in my playtime, dynamically speaking, on the board that resembles or gives me the closest vibes to Spirit Island. Not exactly Spirit Island. I'm not going to tell you it is. I'm not going to tell you if you like Spirit Island, you'll like this. But it's given me the closest vibes to that in a good way. You're putting out fires. You have dynamic turns going back and forth. Now, the big difference is that it's player game, player game, not players game. So that's different, but the machines overarching the hex space system, the not overly needed, unnecessary deluxifications, they, they just weren't there. And so that was kind of nice that they didn't miniaturize this and super acrylic this, that, or the other. They're giving some more asymmetric dynamics to the factions, which was one of my biggest cons or slight criticisms during the campaign in my video in the first place. And so I, I just think that this game, again, is going to be a surprise dark horse for a lot of people if you weren't paying attention. Is it going to be for everybody? No. The card playing dynamic, again, of the blind laying and trying to dynamically uh, cooperate with your uh, allies when you don't get to know what each other are playing, I mean, that's going to be a little bit too random for people. They aren't going to like it. And the difficulty is significant in this game. The tent laying, the, the tent city building esh, whatever you want to call it, of having to get so many points to move your little thing across, get the tent, lay it down, and then reset it every time to go back and again as one of the end game scorings of getting all of your things out there. It's clever. It's unique. It's doing something slightly different, but not getting away from the strengths that this genre has and utilizes in the first place. So very impressed from that aspect and easily again. I think could easily fall on my top tens of 24 depending on how strong 2024 is because if anything has shown us both of the stuff that's come out this past year but also the stuff i've seen on crowdfunding on this list 2024 is going to be dynamically also a very strong year already at least for me 2023 was an amazingly strong year as well and if you disagree with that well you're just not playing games that are right for you because there's tons of stuff across the board my top 10 list spoilers here of 2023 having seen some of the other people's top 10 lists of the year is going to be dramatically different than a lot of other people's that have already put theirs out there halfway through the month of december dramatically different and that should excite you one because i'm freaking different than everyone else because i'm a freaking freak of nature but two because that means that it's not just everybody having an echo chamber of the same experiences because we know that as gamers I don't vibe with some of the other people. You don't vibe with me. You don't vibe with Dice Tower. You don't vibe with Shut Up and Sit Down. You know, your tastes diverge from whoever it is, right? So you try and find people that are similar to you. And so you can is what that means. If it's me, great. If it's not me, that's even better because you're going to find someone that's more better fitting in that sense. Because of the diversity, you're going to have a better chance of finding that in the first place. And you should be more excited by that. I diverge. Let's go to number six. Number six, one of the more recent ones here at the end of the year. Kelp. Again, a little bit similar, though, in the same sense to Old King's Crown. Where, even more so, I think a lot of their money raised at the end. Uh, I dare say. I think it had a little bit of the hype train. I think you saw people piling on because they saw some game that they didn't know about, that didn't get the hype initially, that wasn't covered by a ton of huge people hyping it as one of the best games on crowdfunding of the year, all of a sudden raising half a million? Half a million plus? Huh? Huh? I'm missing out? Oh my gosh, what's going on? I need to, I need to get it too. And so, I mean, it's a two-player dynamic asymmetric game of octopus versus shark, right? 
where you have some hidden movement, you have some deduction, but you have some direct take that as well as some complete and utter randomness in some of the draws, the tiling and the guessing. So people aren't going to like that. And again, if you weren't paying really close attention, the blame is only on you. You have no excuse nowadays not to know how a game plays before you get it. Now, if you have an experience like I did with, say, Fit the Print, where you know how it plays, but the how it feels when it hits the table versus how it, you think it's going to feel doesn't fit. Well, that's one thing. But the just not having a clue and going, well, this was just a poor choice, that's on you, man. Again, small publisher, Wonderbow Games, it's putting out just a very solid product. And again, the nature theme is the big winner probably of end of 2022, second half of 2022, all of 2023, right? Right now, as we speak, a bunch of people are putting Earth out as their top game for 2023 for their lists. And, you know, what theme is it? Leaf? Anybody? Life of Amazonia? I'll be talking about in the near future on my channel. Like, a lot of those games, right? We're seeing a ton of it. Canopy had a second uh, crowdfunding campaign this year. Expansion to go along with it. And those are just the ones I can think of off the top of my head. There you go. Absolutely fantastic game, though. Love it. Uh, very easy to get to the table. You don't need to know the other person's uh, moves and all of their powers and such like that with a lot of these other asymmetric games that you may need to in the head-to-head. -head. And so that was a little bit refreshing as well. So I'm done rambling there, hopefully. Uh, and we'll go on to number five. Number five, again, very recent here at the end of the year. This one would be higher only because it's a little bit harder for me to get to the table. A little bit. Singularity. Singularity! These guys put out an awesome campaign. It only raised like just under $200,000, I think. And I'll say though, it's when one of the more unique, refreshing two-player duelers that I've played in the last year, year and a half. It just was something that worked. I, I was actually really trepidatious about it. You know, I had a meeting with them online, a little face-to-face -face Zoom talk over Discord and just clicked. And then even getting the game, I said, mm -hmm. what am I getting myself into, right? Because I, you know, I've had a bunch of those where it's kind of worked and it also kind of hasn't at times. Like I think, again, speaking of what I just said, I think this is what I'm getting and then I actually get it and it's, ooh, I made a mistake. Ooh, like, this is not what I was thinking necessarily. And sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a bad way. This is in a good, good way. I, it was a lot simpler to get to the table and the, the, the rules was not this. It was the strategy of those rules that allowed this amount of depth. And it's significantly different than the other ones that I love already. Exceed, Yomi, Battlecon, Summoner Wars, all of those. And I don't need the deck construct. Can I? Sure. Do I need to? Heck no. You're going to give me more asymmetry as well at the end product? Boom shakalaka, baby. It's an old NBA Jam reference for those of you that have Super Nintendo. And so that was just really nice and refreshing. And the only having three powers per character, but five characters on the board of rotating these powers that just go from the top of the stack to the bottom of the stack and rinse and repeat just works. Tagging in, tagging out. I didn't think that would be a dynamic that I could see working very easily in sort of the, the video game port aspect of that, where, you know, you've got your tag team battles and you can Street Fighter ask them in and out. And that just worked. So... Color me really impressed by that one. And the aesthetic, I love the aesthetic too. Again, I'm not a huge aesthetic fan. You know, aesthetics are always less important to me than gameplay, but this one, it was succeeding on both. So that's why it was easily number five on this list. Number four, again, this was probably one of the smoothest experiences as number four here of all of these games that I played. It just felt like the mechanisms were so cohesive in Endeavor Deep Sea. I have never played the original Endeavor. So I went into this going, hmm, okay. Am I going to like this? I have no idea. I have no idea. I'm scared. They're sending it to me. They trust me. And I played it and I was like, wow, this really works. Because the big thing you fear on some of these uh, slightly more modern Euro game designs, right? At least I do. Especially when the rule book starts getting thicker there tend to be just one or two elements slightly out of line. Slightly, you just don't feel as they're as important. They just don't feel as quite cohesive. Like with Apiary recently for me, the research deck, it just felt like something was slightly off with that one. Not bad, 
but just a disconnect compared to the other extensive hex-based system that the whole 90% of the other game was built around. And so for me, it just felt a little off. I didn't mind it, I utilized it, but it just didn't click with me as well. Similarly, there was one small element of unconscious mind that I talked about in 2022, very similar in that sense. But this one, it just felt like the diving, the resource management, the, the grid making in terms of how far you can go down and placing your tokens on each of those areas as you're dynamically gathering your workers, getting them upgraded, flipping them over to get more access to more options of your actions in the first place. It just all felt like it worked. The only concern I had was, again, I think this was addressed in the campaign, was the workers that I had, the types of workers that you can recruit for your asymmetry actions, was that, you know, there wasn't maybe quite enough. And some of the highest level ones were all asymmetric. All the lower level ones, like the ones and twos, were all the same. And so when you only really got up to the threes, and so I just a little bit more variety at the lower ones, probably giving it more of a dynamic system and, and change. And I only played it competitive, truth be told. I didn't ever play it cooperative. And so as a co-op fan, right? That makes me even more excited because if the cooperative was halfway decent, I already know I like the competitive. So boom, knock that one out of the park. Again, one that I played, I think I even said it on the video with a couple of these top ones that it was gonna be on my list for this. So. There you go, money where mouth is. You can you can check the video out. If you don't believe me, go check some of these videos out, folks. I mean, because people are gonna go, nah, he didn't say that, no, nah, he didn't. Yeah, he did, Lee Tridonis. Anyway, that's all I got. Number three, number three, this one, again, you're gonna be surprised that this one is number three. And you're gonna be, you know, very interested to see what number two and one are here in a second. Number three, Bitewing, you know, done done pretty decent by me. They've sent me some things to play. They've sent me some things to try out. And this was the one by far and away when they announced this one, I said, oh, 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 me, 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 me. Like the giddy kid in the back of the classroom who knows the answer, right? Cascadero, the Knizia, Tiling, in that line of things, right? I own pretty much everything else. And the only one I didn't own at this stage was Through the Desert. And guess who backed that on crowdfunding this year when it came back around from all play? This guy. So yeah, he has his Samurai, he has his Yellow and Yangtze, he has his Tigris and Euphrates, he has Blue Lagoon, he has Babylonia. He loves them all. I have them all, I'm keeping them all. I don't think they overlap. Do they overlap? Sure. Do they overlap enough for me to get rid of them? No. So this was another line. This was a different dynamic. This is a combination of your Babylonias and your Blue Lagoons. And it takes the time length of Blue Lagoon. It gives you a little bit more depth of mechanism with your Babylonia, but it takes the ease of the rules of Blue Lagoon again, so you're not having to take as long to teach it from Babylonia. And so that was great, but it also does a different dynamic is you don't want to be first, which is very different in a lot of these hex-based games where being first, being the first one there is going to get you an advantage. In this case, oftentimes it was a disadvantage. So how do you maneuver that disadvantage and the slightly twisted different way of thinking, sort of like if you've done crossword puzzles or you do crossword puzzles at all, right? You get these clues that seem obvious, but they're a play on words in a way that you're probably not aware of unless you do enough of them to notice that I have to twist my thinking just, you know, 60 to 90 degrees to be able to see what they're actually pointing at rather than the most obvious, literal, sometimes interpretation of the clue in the first place. And that's what this did from a mechanistic standpoint, right? Is that not descriptive? That was a pretty good description. You can let me know in the comment section down below how good I'm doing this week. And so that was why this one just worked so well. And this was basically, this was basically a production copy, if you will. There's no gameplay going to be changing. Like with pretty much every other game on this list so far, I'm sure some element of the actual mechanistic approach is going to change in slight different ways. Maybe, maybe not the abstract ones, but this one probably the most consistent with what is going to be the end product as a whole. And that is why I'm going to tell you right now, when I get my copy in 2024, it's going to be hard for that game not to be on my top 10 of the year. I'll tell you right now, a year in advance, probably 13 months in advance before I make that list, it is likely going to be on there. And don't be fooled. If we get Endeavor Deep Sea, as well as Singularity, and maybe even Old King's Crown next year and Defenders of the Wild, those are all going to be high contenders for games on my top 10 list of the year, folks. They're that good. They're that good that I feel that solid about them already. So, right? And you can, you can quote check me. Hit remind me. 
in a year to see if Liege is actually telling the truth. Because I am. I shill, but this is the kind of shilling you get on this channel. So, right? He gets very animated here. So what's two and number one? What's two and one? Two. Well, I mean, I talked about it. I alluded to it. You know, if you were paying attention, if you watched that part of the video, if you skipped over and you just went to two, well, go back and watch it. You deserve it. Uh, Mythic Mischief. Abstract. Thematic. IV Studios. Deluxified. Does it need to be deluxified? No. Does it work with a thematic incorporation? Yes. Are you getting four new expansions? Yes. Do I love two of them? Yes. It's awesome. It's just more of a good thing. I mean, the biggest problem with these asymmetric faction games is that you inevitably get one or two factions that you don't like. But you know what? I've made my peace with that. Root, this, I'm awesome with it. I'm cool with it. Don't care. Because you know what also is great about that? My wife doesn't like the ones I do. I don't like the ones she does. And so guess what? Do they get wasted? No. They all work out in some way, shape, or form then. So manipulation of your pawns and other people's pawns, putting them in the way of the enemy so the enemy runs into them on turn. And just it's just clever mechanism. And the thing that didn't happen with this, it didn't turn into power creep. Didn't turn into power creep, didn't turn into rule creep, didn't turn into anything like that, right? You even have a blitz mode as well. Sort of your chess a la mode, if you will, which I, I, frankly speaking, I love. Because that's the problem with a little bit of the abstract genre in general is that you get people sometimes that are so up in their head about this and so trying to make the perfect move in the perfect information game that it takes too long. Like, come on, man, just make a move. It doesn't have to be the most optimal. Just have fun, play with it, go to win, but don't go to sit here and take five minutes. So, okay, blitz mode, boom, there you go. Blitz mode, oh, your character gets knocked out. You don't get to replace them. They're just gone for the rest of the game. Then, serious consequences. It just works. Their best game, hands down, my favorite game from them. No qualms about it, you know, period, period. Putting that out there, boom, shilling for that. I, whatever, right? <laughs> Shill. So the last one up, you didn't hear of it. You didn't watch my video of it. Some of you did though. This was actually one of my biggest reviews in the first part of the year. And I just got the final copy. So spoilers, it's maybe gonna be on my top 10 list of 2023. I'm probably the only person that is going to have this game on their list, any list. And this is Nakajima. And I saw someone post online, they're like, Rhino Hero does this a ton better. I'm like, what game are you playing that Rhino Hero does this better? If you missed my video, I had the most improbable thing ever happen on camera on my channel. This is a game where you have wooden poles that have a string between them, and you have to place them based on die rolls in two of the four quadrants that are on a circular board. And you have to then make stacks so these lines don't touch each other because they're power lines. And then if you pull the wrong cube color-wise, you have to put a cat hanging on these things. And the one thing I'll say, the biggest criticism is these cats and balancing on the ropes, they're very difficult. Very difficult. But this is in no way anything like Rhino Hero. So the fact that it got compared to Rhino Hero, where you're stacking cards up and a little meeple on it, it's just completely different dynamically. This is so much more difficult, so much more fun than Rhino Hero. Like, I had Rhino Hero. Played it with my kids when they were young, like four or five years ago. It wasn't fun! It was okay-ish. My kids thought it was kind of okay-ish, but this came in the mail. And my nine-year-old was like, hey, what's that? I'm like, hey, remember that game? He's like, yeah, can we get that out right freaking now? I said, what? Yeah, can we play it tonight? Like, he remembered it nine months later. Comes with a little couple of mini expansions, haven't even touched on those. So easy to play, rules are easy, dexterity difficult, can play cooperative, competitively, and you just have fun with it. And you can challenge yourself too if you really want. If you have a group that really like, if you've never played Animal Upon Animal, one of the highest underrated games of all time, I'll tell you that right now. Very hard if you actually play by the rules. We never play by the rules, we just try and stack animals up. But if you actually play by the rules, that's actually a very difficult game. Very mean, very cutthroat. This doesn't have to be because it has a cooperative mode. So that's why number one game that I played easily, the most played of any of these games on this list, as well as the most fun as well for a full range of dynamics and situations and groups. So there you go. That is my top 10 plus two lists of games that I covered on crowdfunding this year. My thoughts on them, looking back over the past year, where I stand and how I feel about them still. So there you go. Putting my money where my mouth is, as always. I'm a shill.
I don't know. Over 9,000! We're not to 10 yet, so I get to say that still. Prove me wrong. Subscribe so I stop making random DBZ references at the end of videos. In case you're not familiar with that meme, the over 9,000, when Kakarot, also better known as Goku, is flying towards Nappa and Vegeta, and Vegeta's got his scouter on that reads power levels and tells you how strong people are, he freaks out and it breaks because he's like over 9,000. That's the quote. And Nappa's like over 9,000, which is a ton at that point in the series, at the beginning of the series. So um, now that I'm at 9,000 subscribers, <laughs> It's the perfect time to use it. So I think it's hilarious. I'm watching Jujutsu Kaisen right now. That is probably the best anime I have seen in years. Years. I love it. I am so tempted every single week just to go and read the manga to get ahead to know what happens more. But I'm holding off the temptation every single week. It's tough. No lie. It's tough. But absolutely fantastic. So anyway, I'm done rambling at the end of the video here. It's too long to begin with. No one's watching this part anyway. No one cares that I'm watching anime or making anime references. Peace out. Stay later. Have a great freaking day. Stay classy. Thanks for watching.